correct? Correct. And was that in response to a number of complaints and information from sources about those issues? Correct. And that has led to some significant reform and intensive reforms over the last three years, is that correct? Correct. That, that led to the ward records plan, which I talked about before in terms of organisation of the archival collections and digitisation of records. I just want to note uh, through you some of the key findings in that report. <coughs> the report describes who wards of the state are, and it estimates that based on various estimates, there are likely to have been at least 130,000 children who were wards of the state over the last 150 years, and that includes at least 50,000 between 1960 and 1986. And that helps to explain, does it, why the DHS has around 80 linear kilometres of historical records, mm -hmm. correct? Yes, correct. <coughs> And they are stored in boxes in numerous locations around the state, is that right? Um, no, no, the, the bulk of the records are stored in uh, two main facilities in Burke Street in the city is our primary <coughs> record collection and in uh, the Public Records Office of Victoria, uh, the older archival collections for permanent retention. As at March 2012, the Ombudsman report notes that the DHS had only indexed and catalogued records relating to 26 of the 150 plus years of records relating to wards and institutions. And the majority of those records in 2012 had not been inspected, indexed or scanned. Have there been significant efforts to address that over the last three years? Uh, yes. Um, the first and most intensive part of the words ward record plan was uh, indexing and cataloguing of records. So Are you able to say how many of the 150 years have been indexed and catalogued to date? Uh, not in year terms. So there were 92,000 boxes of registers uh, and indexes that were catalogued and uh, stored uh, and metadata records are created in TRIM, our records management system which enables us to find those records more easily. In 2012, the D it was noted that the DHS received around 1,200 requests a year from former state wards wishing to access their records. Is there an expectation that those numbers will decrease as a result of the resources being made available for wards now? Correct. That, there was a peak of activity. We now receive in the order of 550-odd requests per year to either the FIND or the FOI teams. In March 2012, the DHS noted that approximately 21% of all searches for records relating to FOI requests by former wards resulted in no documents being found. Mm. Was that as a result, and in some cases minimal documents, was that as a result of the destruction policies or the difficulties in searching for documents or both? Uh, pr primarily the latter would be my understanding. So the difficulties primarily relate to the inability to find records which are probably in the collection. Um, that, that has been significantly improved by the activities under the Ward Record Plan. Um, it's now actually a relatively rare event not to find any records at all. Uh, in fact, um, in the last 18 months or so, we have only 34 active cases where there has been a null response, and of those, 15 have subsequently been found. When there is a null response, um, we make a record of that, and if records are subsequently found through the um, organisation of the collection, then we go back to the care lever and notify them that records have been discovered. <coughs> The March 2012 Ombudsman report noted a lack of clarity around what records are held by private institutions and the arrangements between DHS and private institutions that hold documents in relation to wards of the state. Mm. At the time of the publication of the Ombudsman report, people that made a request were directed to the private institution that DHS believed held the records, but there was a large variation in the standard of record keeping amongst private institutions and records from private institutions only became public records when they were received by a department when the institution closed. You understand that that caused a lot of distress and frustration for former wards? Correct. Has anything been done about that? Um, the department works closely with 
other institutions that hold these records and collaborates to the best of our ability to make sure that there is liaison between the department and MacKillop Heritage Centre, for example, with regard to um, where records are located. The Royal Commission has received a, a lot of requests from Care Leavers Network and others who were frustrated about achieving, trying to receive their files, mm. where they were passed along between institutions, some government institutions, some non-government non institutions. Mm where children spent time across those multiple institutions, is there an effort now made by the government to collect their records rather than leaving it for the care leaver themselves? Um, not to collect the records, not to my knowledge. So where state-owned institutions or institutions that have closed, um, are um, the, the record collections are handed to the state and we would add those into our archives for discovery. Um, community service organisations that still hold their own records. Um, we just have to try and make sure that our teams are as knowledgeable as possible about what record collections exist outside the department and how to assist care leavers to most appropriately find those records. So former wards are still in the position of sometimes of having to make multiple requests for files across agencies? Yes. Can they receive any assistance from that, from the councillors you talked about in FIND or from somebody in the FOI team? Um, where we can, we try and assist people to locate records that are not held by the department. It's also um, historically been the case that um, records are held in different parts of state government agencies. Um, health records, for example, held by the former Department of Health um, with, with regard to psychiatric assessments or some things like that, administrative records. Um, since the Department of Health and Human Services have come together again, there is a more streamlined process to search through those collections because it's now part of the one department again. Um, so that helps with regard to um, depart department held records. Um, there are still many records stored in different places outside of the state government. Mr Hodgkinson, at paragraph 82 of your statement, you note that as a result of the ward records indexing project, which you told us about earlier, and the ward records plan, which you've also noted, additional records are often found after a client makes an initial request. In those circumstances, is the survivor contacted by the department or is it up to the survivor to try and take the in initiative? Mm. So I've noted that in the event of a, an entirely null response, where no records are found, then that is a, a rare and unusual event, and we do um, make a note of that. And if records are subsequently discovered, then we proactively go back to the care lever to advise them that records have been found. In the event that um, additional records are found after an inquiry, no, we, we don't go back um, proactively. That's essentially a, a, a matter of pragmatics. Um, it's also not necessarily our place to intrude on the lives of care leavers that may not appreciate that contact later on. So we tend to say to people that if they continue to have an interest in accessing their records over time, that they contact the department again and make a further request. Do you say that's something that's, that care leavers should be advised about, whether they're dealing with FOI or FIND? Yes, it, it, it should be. If, if it's the kind of thing where they are likely to have an ongoing interest in this, then it may be the case that more records will be discovered in the future and they should contact us again to make another request. Where care leavers make a, re a request for their files, are they automatically given information sheets, which contain information about the process and their appeal rights, for example? Uh, yes. There is a, a series of form letters and guidance on the standard information which should be provided in each case. Do you know whether or not any of those form letters provide information about care leavers at making further requests? Um, not, off, not definitively off from memory, um, but, but I think that's likely to be the case. And if it's not the case, it would be a good idea to accept that? Yes, yes it would be. Do you know now how many children there are in care in Victoria? 
And if it's not the case, it'll be a good idea. Do you accept that? Yes. yes Do you know now how many children there are in care in Victoria? If you don't know those numbers, we have somebody from the department, of course, coming. The yes. The secretary no, I coming. No, I can't, I can't give an answer to that. Okay. Our information suggests that children in out-of-home care in Victoria, as at 30th... Understanding. Where are the records for those children in out-of-home care kept now? So we need to distinguish between records which are currently in use and records which are being stored for archival purposes. So um, records currently in use, to my knowledge, for example, in out-of-home care, um, could well be stored in the out-of-home care facility if they relate to records which are, need to be used on a day-to-day -day basis um, and kept and held and maintained and added to on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, additional records may also be stored in DHHS offices uh, in regard to case files and such like. As they come to the end of being operational, the person is no longer in care, then they are transitioned into the archival storage facilities. And you say there are now only two archival storage facilities that are used in Victoria, is that right? Uh, that's correct. Mm -hmm. Some survivors have spoken... Uh, just actually, to clarify that, um, there is a storage facility in Burke Street, there is long-term storage in the Public Records Office of Victoria, and there are some outsourced storage facilities which are in different locations. Does that cause any difficulty in terms of locating documents for the former wards? No, the, um, the storage facilities that are under outsourcing arrangements are for record collections that are very well understood and able to be found. Some survivors have spoken in the Royal Commission of their sadness that there are no photographs of them as children mm. or other records that you might expect from being brought up by where, where you have a mother and father as a parent or two mothers or two fathers in a family environment and where the department takes over, there aren't the sort of family records mm. that one would expect and help you appreciate your childhood. Has, been, has there been an effort to change that? Um, look, we're now, are, you, are you primarily asking this question from the perspective of wards of the state in care outside of juvenile facilities? Yes. Yeah. So um, we need to look at this in the context of the evolution of practice for care. So um, in times gone by, and, and we can think of it in, in terms of simplistically my picture of the thickness of files. In times gone by, the files were really an administrative document which related purely to the ins and outs of the child from different care or programs or things that were administered, incidents that happened. Um, over time, there's been increasing sensitivity about the fact that these records also are part of documenting <coughs> the way care is delivered to a child. Um, and also serve, in the end, as a record of the child's upbringing in the way that a good parent would record information of this nature. Um, so over time, um, there have been disciplines in, in place to record more information, and there is a framework which is used called LAC, Looking After Children, um, which includes quite a comprehensive collection of information about aspects of the child's life and development, education, health, uh, emotional um, issues, and this then becomes part of the record which is completed. Um, there is a trade-off in all of these things between the onerous nature of record keeping um, and, and, and the keeping of a fulsome record. So the, in all cases, um, it comes down to the individual carers and their approach to record keeping and such like. But to answer your question directly, um, there is much more attention given now to recording things such as photographs and events of significance in the person's development or their life. Is, that a, is there a recognition that that's important to the well-being of a child? Yes, yes there is. And just uh, to make the point, that is about good practice, not just good record keeping. So records are a consequence of practice, and practice has evolved significantly over the time periods that we've been considering in this Royal Commission. Uh, 
Uh, finally, Mr Hodgkinson, I note that attached to your statement is Annexure A, which sets out a significant number of documents which you've said to the Royal Commission are relevant to the evolution of the understanding that documents are very important to recording the life history of a ward. Yes. And they include the Department of Health and Human Services Records Management Policy as recent as April 2015. Yes. And a document which is entitled Access to Records by Forgotten Australians and Former Child Migrants, Principles for Record Holders, Best Practice Guidelines. There's still a way to go... That's from 2015, isn't it? There has been work over the past three years in implementing a number of recommendations from the Ombudsman report. Is that correct? Correct. Mm -hmm. It's the case, isn't it, that the Royal Commission has been provided with a document which is from the Human Services Wards Records Plan and it sets out the efforts that have been made to implement the Ombudsman's recommendations? Yes. That process is not yet complete, though, has it? The uh, no, that pro program is com scheduled to complete in September next year. Your Honour, I note for the record that the Wards Records Plan with the Ombudsman recommendations is in the Policies Tender Bundle F at tab 16. Um, and just maybe to clarify that, the, from the point of view of the matters in front of this Royal Commission, the Ward Record um, Program has completed its work on ward files, um, children, youth and family client files, uh, and coming to the end, I think, of disability services files. So remaining is mental health files and um, a series of administrative records. So the bulk of the work required to index the records that would be relevant to this discussion has substantially been completed. I want to put to you some questions that have come in particularly, for, specifically from mm. former wards. Yep. One of the recommendations, the first recommendation was to develop a three-year plan for the identification, indexing, conservation, storage, management and provision of digital access to records, and you've already discussed that. Can you tell the Royal Commission whether or not the Department has identified all the records of non-government agencies that are within the department's custody that relate to former wards? I, uh, I believe that would be completed, yes, um, as part of the original indexing work. Um, I don't know that factually, but I believe that would be completed. Is there a list of the non-government agencies which have records which are in the department's custody? Uh, yes, yes. So that's for somebody who is a former ward who wants to access that list, that's information that should be publicly available if there, a request is made to the department? Uh, correct. <coughs> Some survivors of sexual abuse have advised that they, uh, there are they've heard of a significant number of different databases that contain the records for them. Has there been an effort to consolidate those records onto one database? No, I, I would say not. The process has been to make them discoverable. Uh, there's a considerable amount of work involved in, as it were, consolidating collections into a single database. Um, so you, you may say that the digitisation work achieves some of that objective. Um, the reality is the different collections uh, would substantially stay separate but be indexed and discoverable. I have nothing further for this witness, Your Honour. Might I just make one correction? I was referring earlier to a document at BGD 8 which was a document that BGD did not have access to. I think I noted that that was a document that had been signed by Jay Lyons and Brian Fitzgerald. In fact, it's a document which is not signed. It's a classification action sheet. The youth officer is T best. It doesn't change the nature of the question asked, but I should correct that. For Thank, the you. Thank you. Thank you. Any... Before we go to the um, bar table, I just have two two areas I'd just like clarification on, mm -hmm. please, Mr. Hodgkinson. Um, the first area, with respect to redaction, which does cause a lot of angst with um, 
former wards and care leaders. Is it your view that best practice would be to provide in writing specific rather than generic reasons for the redaction decisions? Uh, yes. And is that the practice in the department at present? Um, there are, at this point, there are a series of kind of form letters and statements which describe this type of thing in order to um, make it easier for the staff to know what to say um, and to provide a reasonably standard response. Um, I, I think the staff do make an effort in the area of redactions that seem insensitive or um, there are a lot of redactions in a file, whole pages redacted. They do make an effort verbally to interpret that. Um, it's fair to say that we can always do more to provide context and explanation in those cases. Um, and that's something that the teams do try and do, um, but within the constraints of time and resourcing. The second area I just want to get your response to is, is this. Um, even where a good explanation has been given about the material that's provided and counselling is being provided, for those receiving the records, it's mm -hmm. often later when they have reviewed their files and reflected on their files yes. that they realise there are specific pieces of information that they want mm -hmm. which aren't available. Uh, might be an address, a name, uh, a circumstance. Mm -hmm. um, does the department uh, offer or facilitate um, an informal process whereby applicants can come back uh, for an explanation or to discuss those issues? Mm. Um, with regard to find, then the case officer is, the name and contact details of the case officer are always provided. Um, so there is the opportunity for the care lever to <coughs> contact that person to discuss the file. Um, and they're aware of that? They're made aware of that? Uh, well, then, um, I'm not, I, I can't speak to the exact wording of the letters, uh, but the contact details are provided, um, and they, they're most welcome to call to, to request interpretation or to discuss the file. Uh, I, can't, I, I don't know exactly whether that procedure exists on the FOI unit, but I imagine it, um, it does. Um, FIND operates more of a counselling style service um, and care leavers are always welcome to, to contact the caseworker involved and to discuss the file. Because that would be a practical intermediary step yes. between formal complaint or formal review, yes. which is far more challenging. Exactly. And, I, I and uh, are you giving us the impression it is encouraged by the department or it's merely notionally offered. Yes, I, and I, I can't speak to the exact wording. I, I would say it is at least notionally offered. Um, it would come down to the, uh, to the actions of the individual case officer, whether it felt like it was proactively offered. Well, it's, it might be an odd analogy, but the tax office, for instance, uh, actively um, promotes the idea that mm. any tax decision you can come in and discuss with a tax officer mm. and I would have thought that would have been best practice from your department's point of yes, view. Yes, that would, that would be my expectation of the way this service operates. Um, I, can't, I can't speak definitively to whether or not it does operate that way in every case. Mm. Anyone at the bar table have any questions? Yes, my name is uh, <coughs> Fitzgerald and I appear for BDB and BDD, who were both at Tirana in the mid-1960s. Mm -hmm. Now, as I understand from your evidence, in, in 2015, the record-making and record-keeping policies of institutions and centres <coughs> run by the department are the policies of the department itself. Is that correct? correct. Those institutions yes. aren't free to develop and determine no. their own record-keeping <coughs> policies. Correct. Um, if I could just ask the uh, uh, e-court operator. Sorry, was I? Uh, no, that's true. The record, the record 
uh, disposal authorities and the uh, logic of that is determined by the Public Records Office of Victoria as the record keeper. Yes. Could I just ask the eCourt operators to bring up uh, a document uh, which is BDB5, its heading is DHS 99990130004. And this was a letter received by Mrs BDB in response to a Freedom of Information request. And uh, it'll probably now be handled by FIND because it relates to records from the 1970s. <coughs> If uh, the operators could just bring up the second page of that document. And you can see there that uh, uh, Mrs BDB is told that um, there is no individual Tirana client file that pertains to her and is told that uh, for clients of Tirana with a year of birth prior to 1967, a decision was made by the institution to destroy all client files when the ward attained 21 years. Um, now, now, first of all, do you accept that to be uh, a statement of a policy that uh, existed until the late 1980s? Uh, correct. That was the uh, relevant record disposal authority allowed the destruction of records under some circumstances. Mm. Um, that would, mm, without knowing the specific dates and being able to calculate the maths, that would... It's, it's possible that was um, the policy at the time and that the records were legitimately destroyed under the relevant record disposal authority. You referred in your evidence to a, uh, a record disposal authority having been uh, instituted in 1982. Correct. Was that the, the first RDA that related to wards? Uh, correct. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I think you said in your evidence that uh, that... Uh, authorised the destruction of records when former wards attained the age of 30 years? Uh, there were two, to be more precise in that. So the 1982 Record Disposal Authority was uh, PROS 82 slash 8, which uh, covered records including the youth justice facilities. Uh, it allowed for the destruction of trainee information files when a trainee turned 18 and Poplar Cottage case history files and admission and discharge index cards when the trainee turned 30. <clears throat> and uh, prior to 1982, what authorities were in existence in relation to the records made and kept by Tirana? Um, so these were, uh, 1982 was the first issuance of record disposal authorities by PROV, which covered these areas. Um, so prior to that, individual um, institutions made their own decisions with regard to record disposal. Um, were uh, the individual institutions uh, permitted at law to make their own decisions about those matters? Uh, or was it a responsibility of the department? Um, I don't know the technicalities of the law at that time. The Public Records uh, Act was created in 1973, but it was not until 1982 that um, uh, record disposal authorities were formalised under the Act through the Public Records Office of Victoria. And uh, maybe the, you can't speak to this, but the, the Public Records Act of 1973 provided that uh, uh, the... Uh, uh, public officer in charge of the department or branch in question uh, was responsible for uh, carrying out a program of records management in accordance with the standards established by the Keeper of Public Records. That would necessarily be the officer in charge of the DHS or its predecessors. That would be one interpretation, yes. <laughs> yes. Um, there was evidence given by uh, Mr Ashley Cadd before this commission of uh, the, the destruction of records at Tirana, <coughs> and uh, he indicated that his, uh, his attitude when he observed that was that he was horrified as he understood that those records were required to go to head office. Um, is, it, is it possible that there was an expectation on the part of the department that the records would be transferred at that time? 
Uh, I can't speak to what expectations would have been in place at that time. Um, as I previously noted, um, there was uh, we, we are aware that there was some record destruction at Tirana and Wynn Leighton. Um, that was in the nature of destruction legitimately under the applicable record disposal authorities. And in some cases, there were mistakes made uh, with regard to the destruction of records because it was believed at the time that they were duplicate records, um, but it turned out subsequently that they were not. <clears throat> but there were no RDAs in, in force before 1982? Uh, that's my understanding, yes. Um, and the Act had been introduced in 1973? Correct. Thank you. No further questions. Thank you. Mr. Over. Uh, Mr. Over, I appear for uh, Mr. Robert Cummings and also Gabrielle Short. Uh, you've described the ward record plan of 2014. I just want to ask some questions to clarify what records are actually covered by that. In paragraph 45 of your statement, um, you refer to give examples of the types of documents that are covered. Yes. And is it fair to say that that includes documents which are peculiar to a particular ward or individual and also to the institutions themselves? Uh, correct. Um, both administrative files and personal case files. And how does that apply more generally to the relevant departments, being particularly the Children Welfare Department before 1970 mm -hmm. and the Social Welfare Department after 1970? Are those records preserved as well? Uh, yes, and uh, also the health department in terms of the medical records? Yes. Could I ask for the, um, the witness to be shown a particular document? It's reference WEB 0067.001.0769. Uh, it's the Children's Welfare Act 1958. And I just wanted to ask you about a specific type of record, whether that may be preserved. <clears throat> and if the, if the operators could please take it to page seven zero seven nine eight. Section 74 is the section that I'm seeking to ask questions about. Thank you. Um, you you'll see that this is a section um, with four parts. The first section, subsection, enables the director, the director at this stage being the director of the, uh, the Children's Welfare Department, to order that any ward of the department be examined to determine his medical, physical or mental characteristics or defects. Subsection 2 provides that there's an authorisation uh, for surgery or any other operation, including the capacity to delegate that to other people. And subsection 3 deals with the um, arrangements between the Minister of the Department and the Minister of Health for the medical procedures. Now, these are particularly relevant to my client. Mr Cummings was a man, I'm not sure if you heard, in 1971 was subject to aversion therapy, um, was subject to electric shocks being provided. And uh, Ms Gabrielle Short uh, was uh, subject on two occasions to vaginal examinations against her consent at a clinic in Gertrude Street. The question I'm asking is, first, are you aware of any records which would uh, be consistent with Section 74, particularly any order of the director, uh, any delegations by the ministers to uh, people to authorise surgery or operations, and any documents relating to arrangements between the minister or the minister of health in relation to medical examinations for wards of the department? I have no personal knowledge of these records. If those documents did exist, would they be subject to the preserving? Um, okay, so documents of this category um, may well be contained in the administrative collections of the relevant departments and agencies at the time. Um, 
we would you'd need to look into the specifics of the way uh, the records were collected and um, what practices existed around destruction and I'm, I'm not aware of the specifics of those um, this uh, if these records were um, destroyed prior to the introduction of the Public Records Act that may have reflected practice at the time. I can't speak to that. Um, since the introduction of the Public Records Act and record disposal authorities under PROV, it's likely that records such as these would be preserved um, and perhaps in perpetuity. But I really can't speak to the specifics of that. Thank you. And in terms of um, one of the difficulties for all of the survivors <coughs> is that it seems the records they're being provided with are ones which have their names upon it. Yes. But they were very much <coughs> cogs in a very large machine. Yes. And subject to policies and guidelines of the department. Is there any attempt made in this process to actually provide survivors with those documents? Mm, I see where you're going. So um, what records are provided to provide administrative context for decisions Indeed. made at the time? I, the, look, the narrative for what actually happened to yes. them? Uh, no, I think the answer at this point would be no. That's, to my knowledge, that's not the way we would approach providing information to care leavers. I understand why that might be useful. Um, in some cases, what we're talking about is in the nature of historical research to puzzle over how that, what decisions were made by who, when, what, under what authorities, etc. Um, so that would be a, a very extensive exercise to prepare that historical an, analysis. An extensive e exercise, but absolutely vital for somebody mm. wanting to understand why mm. what happened to them happened to them. Correct. Mm. And has there been any consideration to setting up, for example, undertaking that research project and setting up a public database? Um, not to my knowledge, no. Yeah. No further questions. Thank you. My name is Gillespie Jones. I appear for Joseph Marajancevic, who was a ward, made a ward in 1961 and was a resident of Tirana in 1965 to 1966. I heard um, Mr. Marajancevic's Mr. testimony. Well, I'm at the tail end of a lot of barristers, but uh, yes. I'll ask. There's a few matters that I'd seek to raise. I heard um, Mr. Mr. Marajancevic's testimony. I'm at the tail end of a lot of barristers, but uh, yes. I'll ask. There's a few matters that I'd seek to raise with you. In relation to the health records, uh, his health records uh, are conspicuous by their absence in the documents that have been produced. Mm -hmm. Would it be uh, fair to say that those documents might still be kept in perpetuity, I think, using your words, uh, but would be in some administrative file somewhere in that 80 kilometres? The kind of record that would be kept by a health professional, by a doctor, um, in which case records around an individual consultation, treatment, medications, outcomes, etc. That Those type of records are not held by the department and, to my knowledge, um, have not been, apart from um, some administrative records which we know were recorded for Tirana, Winlayton and Baltara. So the idea of um, the, the fact that the department has med medical records, records of medical treatment, is we do not have those records. Uh, I see. Uh, in relation to the documents that, uh, well, the destruction of documents that occurred before the Public Records Act uh, mm. was enacted, um, We've heard, as has been said previously, uh, from the witness, Mr Cabb, that there was uh, wholesale destruction of records at Tirana. Mm. Um, are you able to give any estimate as to the uh, ward files, or the percentage of ward files that have been destroyed uh, mm. prior to 1973? Mm -hmm. um, uh, as, as I previously commented, uh, there was not wholesale destruction of files. There were some files that were destroyed under legitimate <coughs> RDA authority at Tirana and Winlayton. Um, the best evidence I can say is, as I commented earlier, um, in all of the 
record application requests that we have received. We currently only have 34 records of entirely null returns on ward files. Nice. So of which 15 have been found. So there are some you know, 20 odd cases that we're aware of where someone has requested a ward file and nothing has been able to be found. So that suggests that um, the collections are quite complete in terms of the core record, which is the ward <coughs> file, which was held by the department and its predecessors. Um, destruction may have happened for some other records, for example, trainee information files, which were held in various parts of the institutions and in various parts of the system, and in various ways duplicated the information on the core ward file. We're very confident that um, there has not been, as you say, wholesale destruction of ward files, and never has been and won't be. Um, these files are now preserved in perpetuity. They will never be destroyed. Uh, in relation to how complete those files are, that would depend on the practices that took place would it, at Tirana, say, in the 1960s. Would yes, it be? that's right. I mean, it's a, it's a kind of a disappointment to the fine teams themselves that they can't change history. <laughs> the records are whatever they are. They were created at the time, and a significant passage of time has gone by. Some have been deleted. Some may be misplaced. But... Um, that's a disappointment to the fine teams themselves when they try and locate these records. And I understand the disappointment that care leavers would have that um, sometimes the records that are found may not represent their memory or their perception of what ought to have been recorded at the time. Yes. Um, but there are, as I've explained, many reasons for that. Current practice is much more fulsome recording at the time and much more disciplined storage over time and much more fulsome release under the constraints of the relevant legislation. Yes, thank you very much. If it pleases the Commission, my name's Liam Brown. I'm one of the barristers who's representing the State of Victoria. Dr Hodgkinson, you were asked some questions about the redacted redaction of the information, in particular about information relating to the affairs of a third party. What's the basis on which that sort of material is redacted from material released from the department to former, uh, former clients of the department? So the, um, the department operates under a number of different forms of legislation. Um, the Freedom of Information Act basically creates a, um, a right for people to access information and establishes a set of mechanisms to compel information to be released. So countervailing that uh, is privacy legislation, which uh, protects the privacy of information of individuals under certain circumstances, um, and also secrecy provisions in other legislation, um, such as the Children, Youth and Families Act, which constrains our ability to release information where that may conflict the fact that the information was provided in confidence in court, perhaps, or that it relates to the personal affairs of a third party. Um, so we need to weigh that up, and if we can, um, we seek to contact third parties to request their permission to access to release that information. Um, if those third parties cannot practically be contacted because they are deceased or there are no contact details, then. Um, the best judgment is made in, in the spirit of fulsome release um, under the constraints of law. And when you say judgment, are you there talking about some kind of a discretion <coughs> or is it something else? Mm. It's <clears throat> in the end, it comes down to a person making a decision. Um, but as I mentioned, a, a key goal of the teams providing this work is consistency in decision making under law. Um, so there are guidelines, there is training um, to try and make sure that the decisions made reflect the constraints that the department operates under with law um, and with regard to what, what would be regarded as fair release of the information in the context of um, a request from a care leaver. 
with consideration of the degree to which that material would be respected confidentially by the care lever and such like. So these things are all weighed up in making a decision. It's still, in the end, a decision that has to be made. It's not a mechanistic thing, so it requires judgment. But there are well-developed processes and practices in place to ensure that the right decision is made under law and that decisions are reasonably consistent over time. In your statement at paragraph 64, you say, Section 33, one of the FOI Act states, a document is an exempt document if its disclosure under this Act would involve the unreasonable disclosure of information relating to the personal affairs of any person. And so there, where you're talking about the decision or the judgment, you're there talking about a not the unreasonable disclosure. Correct. What's the process by which the Department contacts third parties? Uh, so, essentially, um, a telephone or letter or email, depending on what information is held as to how that person can be contacted. Yes. And is there a statutory time period that governs that contact? Uh, I believe it's up to 60 or 70 days is allowed in the event that um, that is required. This that can cause a uh, record release to be delayed if it takes time to contact third parties. So that 60-day period that you referred to, that's to allow the third party to contest the release, is that right? Uh, to, to be uh, contacted and to have a discussion and to approve or not approve yes. their, their decision around the release. And does that third party have a right to appeal the decision to release? <clears throat> um, so if they were consulted and they disagreed and it was released anyway? Um, then they do under the uh, the FOI commissioner. So that, that is the kind of matter that could be taken to the FOI commissioner. Yes. And you've mentioned that so this would contribute to or, or explain some of the delays that might be experienced. Yes, that's right. You were asked some questions about the process for mm -hmm. review of decisions made about redactions, mm -hmm. um, and you were taken to a you were asked some questions about a particular document. Now, in paragraph 74 of your statement, you say, when finalising each request, the department provides a package of information to the applicant or their nominated legal representative. This package includes detailed decision letters and fact sheets. Mm -hmm. And then you there set out a um, quite extensive list of fact sheets that are provided. And in an annexure to your statement, you refer, uh, reference those fact sheets in accordance with the documents that have been provided to the Commission. Could I have the following document brought up, which is DHS.3148.001.0001, Do you recognise that document? Yes. <coughs> and it's, you can see, headed Freedom of Information Review of Decisions Fact Sheet. Is that the current version of the fact sheet that's given to applicants for information? Uh, mm, I believe so. I'd need to look at it more specifically. Well, it's the one that was yes. referred to in your statement. Yes. Yep. It could be scrolled down a little. You'll see there it's got a heading, Decisions which can be reviewed. And one of those includes the Commissioner can review the following decisions. First bullet point, refusal to grant access to documents or parts of documents. So that would there be a, a reference to the ability to review decisions about redactions, wouldn't Correct. it? Correct, yes. Mm -hmm. You were asked some questions about destructions of records. Mm -hmm. And in your statement, you set out the legislative basis, both over time and currently, about uh, on which records are held or can be destroyed. And you referred to uh, what are called RDAs. What's an RDA? 
uh, Record Disposal Authority. <clears throat> and who establishes an RDA? Uh, the, the Keeper of Public Records and the Public Records Office of Victoria. And that's under the Public Records Act. Mm. Under the current suite of RDAs that apply to the department, what is the status of all pre-1989 client files? Uh, they must be re retained permanently. And what does that mean? Uh, well, they can never be destroyed. We keep them forever. And what about post-1989 files that relate to guardianship or youth justice clients? Uh, they're all retain retained permanently. Mm. So they can't be destroyed either? Correct. Um, you were asked some questions by my friend Mr Over about um, the statutory and administrative context uh, of the care of former wards at the time. Mm. Are you aware of a website called Find and Connect? Uh, yes. Um, what does that have on it? Uh, mm, uh, I uh, don't know specifically in terms of the content. It um, refers to a range of information around um, uh, accessing records in this case and historical information in regard to care leavers and how they should access their records. Do you understand if it has information about the administrative context over time? Right. I, um, I don't know, to be honest, so I, I don't know that. Yeah. Have you conducted any work to understand the experience of former clients of the department seeking to access their records from the department? Mm. So one, one thing that um, the FIND team does is a post-client feedback survey. Um, so we, that team is all councillors. Um, and with a commitment to a sensitive release, obviously cares about the experience of care leavers in regard to their record access. So there is um, a client feedback survey which has been administered for the last two years. Uh, survey forms are sent to a sample um, and the feedback from those surveys has been uh, overwhelmingly positive in terms of the experience of the care leavers in regard to accessing their records through the FIND team. Um, so there's a series of nine questions asked around the professional and courteous nature of the caseworker, um, their demonstration of understanding of the client's needs, uh, explanations around the service, um, information provided, letters and fact sheets, and a, and a final question in terms of satisfaction with the overall experience of the service. Um, so in 2013, 79% of, um, of, of the survey recipients stated that they strongly agreed that they were satisfied with the overall experience. In 2014, that was 89% strongly agreed that I was satisfied with the overall experience of the service. Um, in questions which talk to the professional nature of the people and their demeanour, so a question such as the caseworker was professional and courteous, 93% strongly agreed with that statement, 91% um, in 2013. Um, there are some questions, uh, you know, strongly disagree with that statement and there are some respondents who um, do express dissatisfaction through this survey. Um, that's a very small number, 2 to 5% um, have expressed dissatisfaction. Those people are followed up with individually um, by phone to discuss any dissatisfaction with the service that they express through the survey. So this is a, a commitment of the, the department's approach to sensitively dealing with these issues. And... Um, as it were, caring enough to ask the question, were you satisfied with the service provided by the FIND team? Um, and the this, this survey responses show, do provide some empir empirical evidence that um, the service is well received by the vast majority um, of, of people who receive it. Thank you, Dr Hodgkinson. <coughs> no further questions, thank you. Thanks, Mr Brown. I'm sorry, I've, I've omitted to ask yes, two questions. On. They're very, very I apologise. Uh, Mr Cummings, 
sorry, uh, Mr. Over for Mr. Cummings and uh, Gabriel Short. Yep. Um, in 1990, Mr. Cummings applied to become a foster parent, and he says that the foster care agency obtained access to his ward file, though he did not authorise that. Mm. Two questions. Was that permissible in 1990? And what is the current position in terms of other people accessing ward files? Look, that is, uh, I heard that testimony, that's highly irregular. I can't comment on how that happened at the time, but that, that would not be current policy to release that kind of information under those circumstances to, to other people. Thank you. Dr Hodgkinson, are you aware of where the medical records for wards or detainees are held currently? Um, so I commented on that earlier. So there are some administrative medical records which are held in the collections. Um, which are held in, the, I'm sorry, I missed that last bit. That are held in our collections relating to um, Tirana, Winlayton and those facilities. Um, but to restate, those are not medical records that would have been kept by the medical practitioner um, in the same way as I do not have access to medical records of my children's medical consultations as a parent. The department does not have access to medical records that are kept by the actual medical practitioner at the time. So using Wynne Layton as an example, <coughs> if the girls were seen by a nurse or doctor who attended at Wynn Layton, or who would, I would draw that, I'll break it up. If girls at Wynn Layton were seen by a nurse who was employed by Wynn Layton, then their file, their documents should be on their file, should they? Uh, I don't know the exact specifics of this. I, I know that there are um, administrative medical records which are in the collections relating to these institutions, and those, to my knowledge, um, would be the kind of records that would record that the child went to a medical practitioner and came back and maybe something around their treatment if they were required to be administered medicine or such like in the facility. But um, <coughs> they are not the records of the actual consultation. So if a, and in, when late, with when Layton as an example, if a child was <coughs> taken to the Fitzroy Clinic, yeah. The, we heard evidence of a VD clinic set up in Fitzroy. Mm. Is it the case that those records would eventually make their way to the department if they concerned a ward of the state, or would they be missing from the department files? Mm. I, again, I can't really comment on the specifics. To the, to the degree that they were part of the administrative record collection, they would have come into the collections. Yeah? But to the, in, otherwise, they may just be held somewhere for, by the Department of Health, is that right? Uh, correct, or it would depend on the institution and their record-keeping practices. Um, it, as a general rule, if it was an, uh, an agency of the department, and th those administrative records will be kept and part of the collections. You note that there are numbers of care leavers for whom the files and records cannot be located by the department, mm. and the Royal Commission understands that there are other care leavers where significant files are missing. Yes. <laughs> what steps are taken by the department to assist those care leavers to find out about their identity, where their files don't exist? Mm. So I, I don't know the answer to that question. <laughs> Do you agree, given your research in this area and your understanding of it now, that it would be useful if the department could at the very least provide those care leavers with information about the institution and follow up any existing staff that might be able to assist them with their history? Yes. Mm. Nothing further, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr Hodgkinson. Thank you, and you're excused. Thank you. Um, Mr. I, given the time, it makes sense, doesn't it, to start the next witness at two? I think so, Your Honour. Thank you. <coughs> May I please the Commission?